Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I am your host, Brian Call, and today we're back with Mark Livesey from the Treeline Academy, and we're talking e-scouting today. This is episode three of our little series on the art of finding elk, and today we're, we're going to talk about evaluating the zones of pressure. Um, it's probably the number one question I get of the, all the course, even, even, even people that are taking the course. Yeah. It's the most commented discussion. Yeah. So in the course, not only do you, um, what's great, this is something that I did not even factor in. I didn't plan for this, but the platform that I'm using to put the course out Mm -hmm. has a discussion forum for every module. And I turned it on thinking, well, if somebody asks a question, I'll right. answer it. Mm-hmm. I had no idea <laughs> that I was unleashing the bear on this. Yeah. So guys are, not only are they asking questions, which is great, mm-hmm. people are providing amazing answers. Like I didn't realize how many cartographers <laughs> I have <laughs> taking my course. Right. Dude, they're posting these detailed procedures how to use arc gis and geocached tiff files and how to overlay them and because i talk about how to do it on an on a map yeah. laid out on the table and these guys are like i love that but did you know you could do it in arc gis you can download these geotag pdfs i'm like what <laughs> so i thought i knew a lot of but these, these so guys. what's funny is i've got these guys that are expert mappers mm-hmm. that are taking the course but they're beginner to, elk hunters. Right. <laughs> so they need the elk hunting information, but yeah. they're passing along the map. pretty badass mapping That's stuff. That's cool. So anyway, this is one of the modules where guys have if really you, jumped in. If you think about it, guys put in, you know, guys and gals put uh, their hat in the ring to draw a, a highly sought after tag year over year. For example, I have 15 mountain goat points in the state of Utah. Within the next three to five years, I will draw... And any weapon mountain goat tag in the state of Utah, mo- most likely. I'm already, I could draw now with an archery only tag. I've been doing that for years since my, I was looking at my kid. She's 16. I'm like, since she was born, basically, I've been putting in tags for, for I've been putting in for this tag. That's a once in a lifetime species. But if you, if you jump over to the elk and the deer, the same thing happens. People put in for 15 or 20 years to draw a prime tag. Yeah. Why do they do that? Because that tag is managed for the greatest opportunity of killing a big critter, right? Because that particular area has a limited number of people who are smashing it and getting it. It's the well, same and, and concept. They're managing that area for that experience, aspect. right? They're keeping but this, the numbers down, but, and the- but access does the same thing. It does. Well, to a degree, to a degree, access does the same thing. So. There are places that you can get a tag for every year, but are so difficult to access that most people don't. Therefore, you have a similar experience to a 10-year draw tag. And that's why outfitters get hired up, yeah, right? Because right. they can horseback you into a spot that you wouldn't go to. People spend that money, yeah. and they get into these areas. So zones of pressure are are so critical to having you know, a, 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 the – Opportunity to kill something big on a really an over the counter or public land, very general tag ish right. kind of experience. You know, it's funny because one the other, you know, this is one of my number one questions area, but it's also when I looked at the membership of my course participants, I've got so many Washington and Oregon guys. Yeah. And those guys are on they're on high alert on this pressure thing because you know, I, I have a hard time convincing them. They're like, there's roads everywhere. There's no way, Mark, I can do what you're saying mm-hmm. and get away from a road. Because if I walk two miles, I'm now I'm closer to the other road. And I'm like, I know, but in some ways, it's actually easier. Because when you've got this wide open spans, I hope I'm going to explain this right, but you've got this giant area of wilderness that there's no access, okay? Mm-hmm. Now you've got to find where the elk are in this giant Big area. Correct. But the more pressure there actually is, sometimes it's easier to find the pockets mm. that are a little more isolated once you do the technique in the, that we go through in the course. Ah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Because you can't really evaluate a giant area for pressure. Right. If you've got this giant wilderness area. They can go anywhere. You, they could be anywhere. The elk could be anywhere from three miles from the trailhead to 20 often, miles from the right, trailhead. Often the pressure for them in those areas 
or wolves or cats That's or something right. else. That's right, bringing them closer. And, and in that regard, how can you evaluate right. that? Like they might be crammed into an area. Wolves move in that, that, that week and they're completely gone. That's right. Well, the other thing too about pressure is, Brian, now that, you know, we've been talking a lot about this in the previous one. People are just willing to go further than they used to. Yes. Guys are getting fit. Guys are getting better equipment. Guys are watching these freaking crazy videos by a couple of dudes I know. <laughs> they're talking about how far they're going. Well, I, if they can, if that loser can do it, right? I'm going to do. He's it. old. Yeah, I'm he, 25. I mean, he, look at that gray beard. <laughs> That's I mean, right. Jesus, I'm 25. I'm a CrossFitter. If he's going 25, I'm going 35. Right. So I'm running into more guys deeper than I ever used to. So. Don't take that discouraging. That makes this even more important. That doesn't mean you're running into a lot. It just means you're running into some. And what I found that even though sometimes you do run into hunters deep, usually I find, again, I'm, I'm painting this with a broad brush. They're usually more skilled hunters. Yeah. They're not blowing animals out. They're not doing stupid things. They're back there for a reason. They... They've acquired the skills and the experience and the fitness. So I don't worry about running into guys too when I'm back yeah, in that far. That's a good point. And it not, matters. Not always. Not always. That's not always the case. But I do think, Brian, most of the time when you're back there and you do run into pressure, so to speak, it's not the kind of pressure that you're going to see. Yep. You know, in the rookie area. In the rookie area. For sure. This year we got into an area and a couple of dudes were back there with us in the same spot and they didn't move the glass from the same knob every day. So as not to spread their scent, move into the basins. They were, they kept way back just like we did. It provided both of us with plenty yeah. of opportunity to ch chase bucks. Uh, some more in inexperienced dudes could have gone through there and completely blown the hunt in, in a second. Same thing happens in, in other areas we hunt like Arizona is key yeah, like that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. We'll get into areas where guys will sit and pattern a buck for two or three days and take their time, and they won't blow in there and, and scare coos deer away or anything like that. And then you got rookies that just show up and they just bomb here, bomb there, bomb there. And it's not that they're trying to do it; they just haven't learned not to do it yet. Right. Maybe I mean I hate I try to give people benefit of the doubt, but um, it's a good point though. So the it's it's sort of like dudes. I'm just gonna throw this out there, okay? <laughs> it's the difference between dudes that are ninja elk hunters and callers. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to go on the heels of a Corey Jacobson, okay? I don't want to hunt after a born and raised crew. He ki they kill elk. They kill elk, but they also, like, they, they, they can come through a, a hunt aggressive. area like a wrecking ball. They're aggressive. Wrecking ball. Like, <laughs> screaming and running and jogging, and, and they get in and they kill. But uh, being my style, not liking to use a call at all the whole time and kind of ghosting through the woods – I like elk to be undisturbed. I like them to just settle into their thing, not knowing I'm there not for, middle for a I week. I like to call, yeah. but I also like to take – I can't tell me elk I've bugled and not gone after because it just wasn't right. Yeah. You know, just the wind, the setup, I'm like, I'm going to save this. Yeah. But you can't do that all the time if you're a mile from the road. Yeah. When you're a mile from the road, when you get a response, you got to do it because if you don't, somebody else is. Right. Yep. Um, now, I'm not saying always, but, you know, you got to – I also find, you know, the pressure when it comes to elk hunting too, the further back, even if there's less elk calling or whatever the case is, they're, they're easier to call. Yeah. They're less pressured. They're easy. You can make a few mistakes calling, mm -hmm. but man, those ones that are hanging out right by the road. They're, they're, they're there. They're educated. They're educated. They've been called to. They yeah. require, not that they won't commit, but you're going to have to get closer before yeah. you call all the factors. You need a perfect storm of events for those bulls to come in. Yeah, I, they I, need you, to be horny. They need I, to be just kicked out of a group. You need to be between him and his cow that he just got done breeding a couple minutes ago. Like you need certain things to fall into place to, tr to trick that bull uh, more than you do in the back country where those bulls aren't as educated, not, not as wary. And they're like, oh, a cow over there? Oh, because they don't run into that scenario very often i uh i think that's 100 percent true so when, zones of pressure when we talk about when i talk about zones of pressure i really talk about you've selected an area okay mm -hmm. that you are interested in mm -hmm. you've done some flyovers maybe with google earth mm -hmm. you've kind of looked at this area you know that it's got some attractiveness to it um, when I mean attractiveness, I mean, it's got some of the elk finding features. I usually do not break into the zones of pressure analysis until I'm pretty sure I like that area Gotcha. because it does take a lot of time to do it the way I like to do it. 
So the way I like to do it is I order the National Forest map for that area. I, I, I have, well, I have every National Forest map in the state of Idaho and Montana, every one that's been published. Mm-hmm. I have most of them in, in Colorado. I have probably 80% of Wyoming. There's a lot of draw units in Wyoming that I don't have or not interested in. But anyway, the point is I take out a National Forest map, and a lot of guys, well, that's not East Guiding. I'm like, yeah, it is, because I really like to look at it on the map. When you're on a computer screen – And you're trying to look at kind of access points. And I just don't feel that I can get the big picture view that I really want. I want to draw a two-mile circle around every access point. I do that almost religiously. I take my map, every access point. Now, when I say access point, I mean established trailhead or dead-end road. That's really what I'm talking about. Or campground. I'm not talking about just a road, okay, at first. Right, right. Not just a road running through. I'm talking about a place that is and a hunter magnet campgrounds dead ends established named when i say established i mean a named trailhead Mm -hmm. like xyz trailhead yeah i will do a two mile circle around those with a sharpie on the map you will be amazed just doing that alone Mm -hmm. how the picture starts to develop you'll be like okay because i'm studying it i'm looking for everyone because we were just talking about this earlier there's nothing worse and i had this happen on a hunt i was my first year in montana I did this. I thought I did have my national forest map, but I missed a freaking dead end road. And we, the further we kept going, the more people we kept running into. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. Mm -hmm. Finally, this one old guy we ran into wearing jeans (laughs) on an elk hunt in the snow, Levi's. I just had to ask him. I'm like, we, we ran into him on the trail. I'm like, where? Where'd you come in from? He goes, oh, that road just right over the hill here. I'm like, what do you mean right over the hill? <laughs> sure as heck. When I looked, yeah. I missed one. And what didn't make was a bad hunt. It just it's pointing out that it's real easy mm-hmm. to look at Onyx or yeah. whatever and see a couple trailheads and then start looking yeah. and not realize, especially I call it when you get unit focus. Yeah. A lot of people like in Montana on the borders, a lot of people don't realize a lot of people are going to come in from Idaho. Yeah. Just because it's Montana, don't think of that. You got three trailheads in Montana. These are the three. But then you got a really close trail in Idaho that you don't really look at. Because they're not hunting in Idaho. They're just accessing from Idaho. Exactly. And so you don't think about it. So laying the map out on the table and doing these circles is step one, kind of when I'm doing this this pressure analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, you can do it digitally, Mm -hmm. of course. Uh, And I talk about a way you can do it digitally. You can't do it with... On X, Gaia, Go Hunt. Can't do it with any of the platforms. They will not allow you to draw a circle of a defined radius. It's weird. You can draw a circle. You can do a polygon. But you can't. But Google Earth has a tool with the rulers, a tip I'll give you guys. You can draw a rate of a three-mile radius. Mm-hmm. And you can export that mm-hmm. as a KML. Bring it into your hunt platform. Boom. You've got your circle. So if you want a two-mile circle, you could bring it in, and then you can move it around, copy that waypoint, um, or you can bring in all of them at once, whatever. So there's a way to take, I call it a hunt parameter. You can set up a hunt parameter in Google Earth. You can export it, and then bring it into your hunt platform and manipulate it. Like you're on X. Like you're on X or your Gaia or whatever, your mm-hmm. base map, whatever you're using. Yep. Um, doesn't matter. It works with all of them. Okay. So it's a that's a good tip. A lot of guys are like, oh, I'd like to draw a radius, but it doesn't allow you to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, do it in Google Earth, export it, and bring it in. Uh, it's like a two-second job. Save it to your desktop, bring it in. It's like yeah. it takes you no time. Um, and we do a lot of how to teaching, how to import and export in the file formats and stuff. We, we go through all of that. But first thing that I like to do is I like to identify all the access points first. That's like mission critical. Because I really want to know, that doesn't mean I won't hunt inside of a circle of two miles. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean, I just want to know where they overlap. I want to know where those circles touch. I want to know what, then I want to see what area is left. Then I usually will take a compass, like an element, you know, you know, pencil with a sharp point, like you use in elementary school. Yeah, yeah. And I will do a one mile on each side of every road. So every road through the unit. I will put a one mile buffer on each side of the road. So I've got a two. So let's recap two mile circle around all access points, mm-hmm. a one mile radius around every road. Mm-hmm. Again, I don't want people to get confused. That doesn't mean you don't hunt it. 
I just want to see the area. You do that on your paper map. On the paper map. Yep. I want to see what's left. Right. Then I start looking at those places on Google Earth, for mm-hmm. example, flying them over, start looking for elk finding features. Because again, that's what we do. Right. Basically. Yeah. So, I mean, but you don't realize you're even doing because yeah. you're doing it in your head. Yeah. But this is a good one. The reason that's what we do when we're trying to find a mule deer spot that no one else will ever go to, or where we we can find a bear or a mule deer that's super old that no one has hunted or found or discovered. I mean, people are asking, how do you guys kill big bucks every year instead of on public land hunts instead of just average bucks? And it's like, well, we don't run into people. Yeah. And when we do, again, it's that rare one person, and they're usually not a problem. They're careful too. Yeah, they're not a problem. Well, and not only that, like. Just because you found the area doesn't mean you can kill the animal. That's right. Right? So that's right. there are people we run into, but they may not have the glassing skills to pick up that buck. Yeah. Or know, the patience. Or the patience. Or the time. Yeah. So I guess the takeaway on this zone's approach, you can do it electronically, but I really like to start with the map. And here's another reason. One, the visual, the vi- the whole visual visuality of laying that map on the table, mm-hmm. especially for a new, a newish elk hunter. Yeah. It gives you so much historical. You start learning the roads. Yeah. You start learning like, okay, well, I could get to it maybe a little better from over here. But when you're looking at the computer screen, sometimes it's hard to get it yeah. all on there because you know that the hunt platforms, yeah. as you zoom in, the level of detail um, increases. Yeah. And as you zoom out, the level of detail Goes decreases. Away. Yeah. So you can't evaluate well when yeah. you're zoomed out. I love paper maps. I've been using paper maps for I years. I think people, if they got back to them, mm-hmm. you're going to find places we use paper that you maps. can't find. We use them all the time. And using just straight digital techniques. Yeah, and the reason we do it is because, the reason, I mean, because I can see an entire area right. in a way that I can't see on a, that, I, that I'm restricted to. And it doesn't matter how big a screen you got. It doesn't work that way. Right. Um, you can have the biggest screen in the world, but it doesn't, the, it's the zoom and the level of detail that's presented within the platforms. Yeah. Even Google earth does well, the same also, thing. It's also cool just to have a, you know, a, a, a two by three map pinned on your wall that you just look at and go, Oh, I see patterns. I see this whole space. There's no access here. Well, <laughs> I should back up because one of the things that I do first, and this is what dri- drives my wife nuts. So, <laughs> one of the first things I do, actually, before I do that, is every one of my Montana maps. When I first moved to Montana, I spent weeks doing this. Weeks, <laughs> I trace every unit boundary on the National Forest map. Do you really for the whole state? I did the whole state, every you unit. Sell those. Do you know how much I learned <laughs> uh-uh. just doing that? No. Think I know every mountain range. I know mo- the major highways. I know all the. You learn just the art. Really? The, and I shouldn't say the art. Just the act of tracing that unit boundary mm-hmm. shows you, it will open your eyes to the possibilities of coming in from another unit or another, or another state. state. Mm-hmm. Um, and even little corners of the unit that you might not, you know how you get tunnel vision. When you look at a unit, you, your eyes kind of want to naturally go to the middle. Yeah. And sometimes doing this, it, it, I'm telling you, I know it sounds so elementary. But just tracing the unit, if if you get any tip out of this, mm-hmm. that one alone will, yeah. will be a game changer for you. So you go through all this in that in that module. I, I even have my maps on the on the video. People can see I the whole thing. Trace them, show them yeah. how to do it. You know what warms my heart, Brian, is now that I've had this going for a while. Guys, they almost think it's a badge of courage now to send me photos <laughs> of these crazy marked up national forest <laughs> maps. They're like, look, here's. And here's then, mine. Here's mine. Well, it is. It's like a handcrafted piece and it's of art. Got every color. We go through all color coding. They've got colors for all the uh, all the areas beside the tra- the roads, areas beside the trails, all the established access points. But think about what you're learning. If mm-hmm. you just go through and you look at every access point, every place you can access that area from. Yeah. And you you look at the road, how you can get there. You you think about. Why would they come from that area? You start looking at um, the terrain from that, you know, yeah. just because it's closer doesn't mean it's a better. Yeah. <laughs> well, and we've, we've, we've been looking at water access. A Crossing lot rivers. Because, like, because with the rafts, the mm-hmm. alpaca rafts, <sighs> dude, we're just curious now at any place we can get into or get out of with a raft, primarily out of, because when you kill you, you have a lot of weight and you can go, you know, deep, deep, deep into some place that you couldn't pack an elk out. But if you have a boat, you can pack it out. You kill a caribou up in some place gnarly, 
you know, up in Canada that, uh, how are you going to get it out? There's well, so much water there. You guys like it's to go like, across and go deep, but even uh, Brian, honestly, most guys are not going to just cross take a pair of waders and yeah. take their stuff across and then stash their waders. Yeah. And I, now I, I do it. Yeah. But just that act guys are, nah, that ain't my thing. Yeah. So you've eliminated a giant population. Right. Right. Just with that. Well, with a five now, pound, we're talking with a about five pound boat, you can cross a pretty hefty river with that. That's right. And now you've you've basically gotten into areas that nobody has been in in a long time. Or at least the numbers are far decreased. Yep. Um yep. so but the other, so the other thing that you want to, that I that I do and this is very painstaking and again I want to I want to reiterate when I start doing this process I'm pretty invested in an area before I start doing the crazy this, amounts yeah. of work. Is this is really an important tip guys. Don't trust the maps. Don't trust Onyx. Don't trust God, for all of your motor vehicle use options. Mm. They're going to be right a very high percentage of the time, but they're not going to be accurate one hundred percent of the time. Things change. Mm. So what you're going to want to do is every national forest has a downloadable motor vehicle use map that you can get off their and I show the links how to get them all. They're very cryptic. It takes time because they're not, they're not print. They're printed just the roads only. Mm. So you've got to have it laying beside your national forest map. And then I take a red Sharpie and I got every road that's open to motor vehicle. I'm transferring from that PDF to my national forest map. Now all national forest maps are not created equal. Unfortunately, the national forest is not really in the business of publishing maps hardly anymore. <laughs> it's all digital, right? So it kind of sucks because you're getting a lot of national forest maps are pretty old. Yeah. Now, some of the more recently updated ones have really good motor vehicle use already on the incorporated into the map, but a lot of the older ones do not. So it's important to take. Now, a lot of the roads are actually on the map. It's just being able to tell what's open and what's not is not is what I'm talking about. Right. So it's really important that you take the downloadable annually updated usually motor vehicle use and transferring it and one tip I'll make sure you make sure you pay attention here pay attention to the dates that the roads are open just because yeah. it says it's open doesn't mean it's open during hunting season and vice versa yeah, yeah. just because it says it's open doesn't mean it might actually be closed especially hunting. in like Idaho one of my favorite places to hunt elk in Montana the road closes September 15th mm. not a lot of people know it it looks like it's open, but it closes. And in in late season, r- rifle particularly in Montana, yeah. the elk want to come back into there right. once that road once closes. That road closes. Yeah. So you want to pay attention to the dates because it seems like nowadays. Like, that could open a door for you that other people don't know about. Well, what they're trying to do, and I understand, they're trying to give more access to public lands for more people during the summer months and things like that. But they also know the impact it has on the animals. So they're closing some of those roads at like the beginning of hunting season. People aren't backpacking anymore. Whatever. It's cold. Or- so, you know, I guess what I'm saying is develop a system, whatever you want, a, some type of color coding, maybe a dashed line, whatever. We talk about custom markup mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. languages in the course. But you got to develop a system that works for you. Yeah. If you take the time to mark up, your maps, like I'm saying, you identify all roads open to motor vehicles and know, understand the dates. You understand all of the access points. You understand the buffer, ro- the buffers around all the open roads. You're going to be amazed what starts to materialize yeah. on that map. What little spots are going to be right. like? It's hard to look at a map, pick that out without doing it. I, um, it's very interesting. Um, you know, thinking about this, one thing that we do is we look for roads to close due to weather. And then we look for During times of year. Then yeah. we, especially for mule deer, it's yeah. like, we're pretty sure the snow will hit now. Now no one can go there except for us crazy fools. Yeah. And, um, I almost want a snow machine at this point for some of the places we want to get to. Cause once that snow drops, you have it to yourself. Yeah. There's very few people that will venture into those spots. Once the roads are all shut down Yeah, and you can't get it into a regular truck. Or an, or a UTV of some kind, like those things can go in some places, put some tracks on it on a, dev- a vehicle like that, and all of a sudden you have now, um, you have now like 
again, late season mule deer, which I've done with a bow, uh, the, uh, the snow came. I had the whole thing, the whole hunt to myself. Every single person went home. Nobody was there. Yeah. For two weeks, that's I'm the, hunting giant bucks alone. The problem is that's not always going to be the case archery elk, though. So True. When, when it comes to evaluating archery elk, you've got to get more serious about the pressure analysis. You can't just rely on people's will. Because when the weather's good, people are willing to go a lot of places. They are. That's when the study becomes more important to me. Yes. I think, honestly... The better the weather, the earlier in the season, the more important the zones of pressure is. Absolutely. The later in the season, the interest levels start to decrease. Yeah. The willingness starts to decrease. Yeah. The cold, the weather becomes a big factor. People don't want to hike five miles in knee-deep snow. There's a lot more factors at play other yeah. than just how close it is to the trailhead. Right, right. So when I say two miles from the trailhead, don't take that with a grain of salt. It's not two miles from the trailhead on november 1st necessarily right it's two miles on september 1st yeah yeah and not always i you know because guys in oregon get so worked up about i've got so many emails about dude we can't get two miles from a road yeah without yeah. some logging road some other road that's open and i'm like well you're looking at this wrong i think if you took the time to mark every road that's open i know there's a lot of them mm -hmm. and it's going to look like a spider web when you get done but when you get them all marked you're going to find look at this little pocket right here that there's no red here. <laughs> yeah. There's no red here. There's no red down here. And those um, animals are going to oh, go there. They know where they're at. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm telling you, everybody's like, well, I'm looking at the map. I'm like, you might be looking at it, but I don't know that most people's brain can really see it like you can once you mark it up. Yeah. I know this sounds crazy, but do an experiment. Take your national forest map. Just do the access points. Just yeah. circle every dead end road. I say dead end roads because they might as well be trailheads. Dead end roads are hunter magnets. They are freaking <laughs> hunter magnets. People right. will drive fifty miles a road, yeah. never hunt any of the fifty miles till the dead end. And there's ten trucks parked at the dead right, end. Right, right, right. But if you'd have jumped off anywhere in the fifty <laughs> miles, you'd have had the place to use. You, you could have realized had you marked up the map that there was a lot of places to hunt. So yeah, it's funny, but it's true. Yeah, we parked a few times this year. Nowhere near the end of the dead end road. We just went on off. the side of the road and just went straight. No one was there. We talk about no that. No one's doing that. And one of the other things I mentioned in this too is I spend a lot of time, and a lot of guys don't even really think about this, I'm sure, is evaluating trail usage. Everybody's like, well, how do you – you can't really get that data. I'm like, well, you can't do this with Onyx. can't do it with Gaia. You have to use Google Earth. Google Earth has the only Zoom capability – that I've seen that you can zoom in close enough mm -hmm. to see the trail to be able to evaluate is this trail a high pressure trail or is this trail a low pressure trail? And we talk about that, how to do that in the course because it's crazy. I don't know if people realize, but Google Earth is now uploading a ton of 2019 imagery. Hmm. Not every area, yeah. but this 19 imagery, the level of detail is so freaking good. You can see pebbles on the ground. So when it comes <laughs> to looking at the trails yeah. and seeing, oh, that looks like a horse trail. It's pretty prominent. Yeah. Or look at this trail on the map. It's all grass. Yeah. Guys, just that little subtleness, if you take the time to look at it, can give you an indication. It's not It's not perfect, Yeah. but it can give you an indication of pressure. Yeah. If you can see the trail, then you know there's some pressure. If you can't see the trail with Google Earth, I get excited when I see a trail on mm -hmm. the topo map and then I zoom in on Google earth at the highs. And that I happened to me in Oregon and a I lot. can't find it. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm going to go there. Or there's a giant burn with like a quarter mile of logs falling across it. Yeah, that's right. And it's like, well, once you get to the other side of it, it's, it's, it's gold. The land that. of, but you wouldn't know if you didn't gold. zoom in and really right. look at the detail. Yeah. And sometimes the big picture won't show those kinds of things. Yeah. And just because it has a trail. Okay. Doesn't mean you want to not go in there. It just means you should look at that trail. Yeah. And this is where we talked about this off air, I think, but trying to not become one dimensional, meaning don't just use one platform all the time. Right. Guys, Google Earth is free. Use it. <laughs> right. I spent so much time. People, as soon as Onyx came out, everybody's like, well, 
Good yeah, Lord yeah, is yeah. dead. Right, right. Well, it ain't dead. It ain't dead. Um, well, and that's what we're going to talk about in the next one. Yeah, we're going to talk about tools of the trade next. But So keep that estimating trail usage, valuing zones of pressure. Either if you want to do it digitally, there's ways you can do it. But mm-hmm. one of the best ways is paper map. pull out that old map and just mark it up. Yeah. That's awesome stuff, Mark. Um, so, uh, folks, I hope that's you found that useful. I mean, it's a good discussion. And it's back, they to, really, it's back to, I call it arts and crafts. Yeah. <laughs> and if you really want to dive into it and see how you're doing it, how Mark's doing it, you can go to treelineacademy.net Not now, and check no. it out. And to use the code GRITTY helps us out, too. Uh, but you can just wing it on your own, too. But I don't recommend it. Uh, <laughs> how much is your course? Well, with your code, it's $99. See, folks, it's worth every penny. It's worth every penny. All right. Thanks for tuning in. Check it out the next one. We're going to drop the next one next week, and that one's going to be re- reviewing tools of the trade, which I assume we're going to be talking about your Gaia, your base map, your Onyx, your paper maps, your Google Earth. And uh, I think the one thing that you ought to know is that Google Earth and, and Onyx are capable of things that you had no idea they could do, especially Google Earth. Especially Google Earth. Especially Google Earth. But I think layers, too, on, on X. People, I talk to guys all the time. Yeah. I have no idea what those layers Especially are. Especially layers in Gaia. For the guys that use yeah. Gaia, whew, there is so much power there. So we'll get into that on the next episode of uh, The Art of Finding Elk. Okay. Mark Livesey. Check it out, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty. <laughs>